Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Lecture Series. Sit back, get comfortable, and let's go see what they have for us today. My name is Leanne, and I'm the lecture coordinator for the Peninsula Seniors. Thank you for coming today. Today we have Dave Way. He is the curator from the USS Iowa, and he's going to be discussing the ship uh, that has been hosted by three presidents, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush, and numerous dignitaries during almost 70 years of service. So anyway, thank you so much for coming today, Dave. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. As Leanne just said, Iowa does have 70 years of history. I've tried to cram that into uh, 92 slides, so here we go. The battleship Iowa was the very last battleship in the world to be saved. No battleships have been constructed since World War II. It's the only battleship on the West Coast open to the public. And America um, remarkably did save seven other battleships. The three sister ships to Iowa, New Jersey, Missouri, and Wisconsin, they have been saved. And also on the East Coast, you have the uh, Massachusetts, the North Carolina, the Alabama, and the Texas. And the Texas is actually from World War I. She's a very special warship. So that's eight battleships America uh, has saved. And that's out of a total of 49 battleships that were built over about a 99-year uh, span of uh, American battleship history. Um, one of the comments I hear in the tour route uh, frequently, and I, I kind of cringe because it's just, it's not Iowa's real story, is Iowa was built to be an anti-aircraft escort for aircraft carriers. And actually, that is definitely not the case. In fact, the Iowas, the four Iowas, are very special warships. And I just want to read a little bit of an opening paragraph. Until the rise of striking air power from aircraft carriers during World War II, Battleships were considered to be the final arbitrators at sea. They reflected the nation's design engineering and manufacturing capabilities of their time, and much attention and pride was bestowed upon them. Battleships projected visible strength in peace and at war, and projected America's national interests and could defeat an opposing nation's battle fleet far from our home waters. The century of American battleships lasted from 1865 to 1995 with their ancestry that traced back to the ironclads of the American uh, Civil War. Through actually several books have come out on the subject, from uh, 1923 to 1940, the United States Navy used to stage what's called um, fleet exercises about every two years. There was 21 of them during those years. And there's another quote from a book that I thought summarized the whole mentality of the American uh, Navy towards the battleships. And they said, despite all the experimentation with aircraft and aircraft carriers, submarines, amphibious operations, and underway fueling, from first to last, the main concern of the fleet problem was the battleship and how best to employ it. And that was all the way through 1940. And this was how we were gonna fight the upcoming war against Japan that everybody knew was coming. The USS West Virginia was the last commissioned warship before the modern battleships came into being uh, when before or just as World War II started. The reason being was after World War I, they had a naval treaty, just like we have SALT treaties today for strategic arm limitation talks. And the first one was in 1920, and this was the Washington Navy Treaty that ended up actually canceling six American battleships. Some had already been uh, started and were under construction. Then in 1930, the London Naval Treaty came along. But by the mid-30s, there were so many war clouds and so many of the nations around the world were basically disobeying the naval treaties uh, for various reasons. Japan and Italy in 1934 basically denounced the naval treaties and had secretly uh, ran off and started modifying many battleships and also building battleships that were outside the uh, criteria or the um, limitations of the naval treaties. Uh, finally, the last attempt to prevent another arms race with battleships was in 1936, and that was with the Second London Navy Treaty, and it failed. 
So for 16 years, um, we didn't have any warship construction for battleships. Finally, knowing that the war was coming up, we began to build new battleships. The first class that came out was the North Carolina class. You can see that in your top left-hand corner. And her sister ship was the Washington, and she came out in April of 1941. And then in the lower right, the next modern class to come out was the South Dakota class. She had three sister ships, the Indiana, Massachusetts, and also the Alabama. Now, traditionally, American battleships had great firepower, great armor, but they were slower. And this presented a problem to the American uh, naval intelligence and also the shipbuilders because they knew Japan had secretly gone back and modified many of their battleships. Here's a picture of the Nagato. It's a colorized picture. It's kind of exciting. She had a sister ship, Mitsu, Masutsu, if I pronounce that right. And they were the fastest 16-inch gun battleships. They had 26 knots speed until North Carolina came along, which also had 26 knots speed. The South Dakota class was a knot faster. She had 27 knots. But the ships that really worried the naval intelligence community of America was the Congo, the Hai, the Kirishima, and the Harunu. They had a top speed of 29 knots, and we even underestimated that. But with this great fear, we decided to build the ultimate battleship with not only the traditional firepower and great armor, but with huge speed. And these turned out to be the four Iowa-class battleships. So they went to work. And notice there's no computers on the desks. This was all slide rolls and papers. This is April of 1938. They uh, used over 429,000 hours of work and generated over 175 tons of blueprint paper for issuing the plans out to the shipyard. The ship was built in a New York Navy Yard, Brooklyn. Her keel was laid in June 27, 1940. And at that point in time, she was a very expensive warship. In fact, Congress kind of choked on her price tag. But the Navy was convinced they really needed this little buffer of a great warship to come out to the fleet. So at that point in time, it was $110 million. If you do straight inflation, uh, it comes out to almost $2 billion today. Iowa was built at a record speed for a capital warship. They normally take you know, four to five years. Iowa in total was uh, constructed in 32 months. Here's a picture of her on the launch uh, ways, and she's uh, seven months ahead of contract schedule and uh, um, launched on August 27th, 1942. The vice president at the time was uh, Henry Wallace, and he was from Iowa, imagine that. <laughs> and so his wife, launched the traditional champagne on the hull. That's in the top right-hand corner. And the gentleman there also with her is Captain Kennedy. He was the commander of the shipyard. And also in the lower right is a, a rare uh, admission card that we were donated. So I put that up there. And another rare color picture uh, coming out of uh, that World War II era. Here's the Iowa going down the ways, being launched. At that point in time, it was felt that she was the heaviest launched uh, vehicle or ship at 39,000 tons. And then on the right-hand side, uh, we have a copy of one of the shipyard workers' uh, newspapers that was uh, describing the launch. While the ships were being built, another thing that had to be renewed in constructing was the big guns. And these were made at the Washington, D.C. Navy Gun Factory. And here you see several 16-inch guns getting ready for all the battleships that are under construction. Iowa's 16-inch guns each one of them is 66 feet long, and when you add the breech, that's another uh, two feet, so they're 68 feet long, and they weigh 292,000 pounds. Here's a picture, another rare color picture of uh, one of the 16-inch guns being pulled up to be mounted in the turrets on board the ship. You can see the superstructure uh, starting to take form with the two funnels or smokestacks uh, in the background. And another uh, rare photograph, now the ship, after being launched, she's going to the fitting out basin, and the big cranes are pulling up the big fixtures to put on the ship. And this is January 15th of 1943. Now Missouri would be under construction just behind her. Uh, the other two ships, New Jersey and Wisconsin, were built in the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. So it's commissioning day. The Secretary of the Navy was part of the festivities. During his speech, he called Iowa the greatest ship ever launched by the American nation. 
Iowa's uh, first duty or combat uh, action was to go off the coast of Newfoundland and guard against the breakout of the Nazi Germany battleship Tirpitz, and that was the sister ship to the Bismarck. And she was a threat to the North Atlantic convoys. If she would have broken out with her big 15-inch guns, she would have created havoc amongst those ships and sunk many of them. So our latest warship stood guard until um, that threat had diminished. Interestingly enough, on this picture, on the top of the superstructure, you can see the antennas, the radars. Normally, the radars were always airbrushed out by the wartime sensors. So how this uh, picture escaped that, I'm not quite sure. This is the ship I just mentioned, the Tirpitz. She had uh, eight 15-inch guns. She was 30 knots, so she was faster than our North Carolina, Washington, and South Dakota class, but the Iowa was still faster than her. Very well armored. Her fire control system, though, was definitely not as great as the modern Iowa's. So Iowa's uh, first commanding officer was John uh, McCrea. McCrea had actually served with President Roosevelt as his naval aide. They had a very close association. And as you can imagine, uh, being a captain of this super warship was a fantastic honor. After uh, the Iowa came back from the Tirpitz watch, she was assigned again another very special mission. And she was going to become President Roosevelt and his war cabinet staff Basically, the Air Force One at the time, they were going to be transporting President Roosevelt over to the Tehran Conference to meet with both uh, Churchill and Stalin. So that was a journey across uh, the uh, southern Atlantic to uh, North Africa. Iowa was pulled into the uh, naval uh, dry docks or shipyards, and there was a couple of special modifications that were made. And there was a bathtub for Roosevelt that was made, and we're... We say the only battleship that had a bathtub for the president because I've since learned there was other warships that did have bathtubs on board. So we can't say we were the only warship with a bathtub. There was also a special, excuse me, special elevator that was installed at least to go up to one deck from the main deck to the O1 deck to the captain's quarters where President Roosevelt was staying. It was just a temporary elevator and remember, President Roosevelt was in a wheelchair at times because he had sort of a polio condition. So the bathtub is still there today in, uh, the president, in the, what we call the president's cabin or the captain's import cabin. It's part of our tour. Uh, we learned later on during the Cold War era that the crew every month would buy raffle tickets to take a bath in the captain's cabin. <laughs> So somehow the revereness of the whole uh, captain's bathtub kind of uh, left us there at that point in time. Uh, as you can imagine, in the captain's uh, quarters, his import cabin, in the wardroom, there was many discussions, we believe, about uh, what was going to take place at the end of World War II, how Europe was going to be carved up, and also we believe about the uh, second invasion, Normandy. We think some very important discussions uh, took place on board the ship. Now, there's a real fun story. Um, one of the escorting destroyers that was next to the Iowa was sort of a hard luck case ship. It was called the uh, William D. Porter, and its nickname was the Willie D. And one day to entertain the president, who was up on a, a veranda, an open deck, in his wheelchair with a Secret Service men, the destroyer came alongside Iowa and did a simulated torpedo run. Well, unfortunately, one of the seamen left the prime uh, arming charge in the torpedo tube, they fired a live torpedo at Iowa. Initially, the crew panicked. They tried to hold radio silence. They grabbed one of their signal lamps and sent over a garbled message, which Iowa didn't understand. They finally panicked, broke radio silence, told them, you have a live torpedo coming to hit you. Iowa increased speed. They turned into the torpedo, and the torpedo harmlessly exploded in Iowa's wake, fortunately. While that was taking place, President Roosevelt thought, hey, this is great entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> he asked the Secret Service people to wheel him over to the edge so he could watch you know, the event unfold. The Secret Service staff pulled out the revolvers. They were going to shoot the torpedo. <laughs> the Iowa's big guns were laid on the destroyer. They thought there was an assassination tip attempt taking place. They were just going to blow the destroyer right out of the water. Well, everybody settled down. They sent the destroyer back to a naval station, an American naval station in Bermuda. They arrested everybody on the entire ship, which has never been done before, 
interviewed him for three days, finally figured out it was just a silly mistake. Initially, they were going to send the one poor sailor to 14 years hard labor. President Roosevelt stood in and said, you know, everybody's suffered enough here. Let's just go on with the war. By this time, the ship had an incredible reputation, of course. She went down to the Pacific uh, to continue her war time years. Every time she would go into an anchorage, the rest of the ships would flash over on their signal lamp, don't shoot, we're Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the war, she was off Okinawa as one of the radar picket destroyers. A Japanese ship plunged right to the side of her hull. The bomb loosened and exploded underneath her keel, broke her back, she did sink. Remarkably, all of the crew uh, managed to get off the ship safely, and in true naval fashion, the captain was the last person to get off the ship. Here's a picture of uh, President Roosevelt. When he finally did arrive over uh, in North Africa, he started taking little puddle hops in airplanes uh, to these various conferences and meetings with world officials, and here he is uh, on one of his planes. And then the formal conference, the Tehran Conference, you can see Stalin on the left from the Soviet Union, and of course England's uh, Prime Minister uh, Churchill. This is a real famous uh, photograph we have on display in the uh, captain's uh, cabin. Now, we always were searching for a picture, a photograph of Roosevelt on board Iowa, and nobody seemed to have one. One day I was on eBay, and I looked at a tiny little brownie camera and found a tiny little snapshot that I think some sailor probably illegally took, and it was President Roosevelt under number three turret on the stern giving his farewell speech. Well, I about fell out of my chair with excitement. Uh, this is one of only two known photographs of Franklin Roosevelt, you can see him in the center uh, sitting down with his cape, giving a farewell speech to the Iowa crew uh, before disembarking. So we were uh, thrilled to have at least that much to uh, show uh, of that Iowa's period of time with Roosevelt. Iowa returned and dropped off the presidential party and then she continued with the war, traveling through the Panama Canal, going to Pearl Harbor and then out to the Pacific to join the various task force groups and aircraft carriers that were doing the island hopping campaigns in the Pacific. And she had um, great anti-aircraft firepower, so she would escort the carrier task force groups. Here's a picture in some special camouflage in the uh, Pacific. And this is January of 1944. As I mentioned, um, her anti-aircraft battery, you can see um, in the center of the picture, if you look very carefully, there's a lot of little guns uh, sticking out. But in total, she carried 52 20 millimeter guns, 19 quad 40 millimeter guns, which is 76 millimeters, and then 20 dual purpose 5 inch guns. These were both anti surface against surface targets like other ships, and also uh, anti air. They had a proximity fuse in those days that they could fire at aircraft that could explode. The Iowas carried the most along with the Essex-class aircraft carriers, the most anti-aircraft batteries, and the aircraft carriers loved having them close by because they were fantastic protection. And, once again, they had the great speed of 33 knots to keep up with these very fast new aircraft carriers that were roaming through the uh, Pacific in those days. Besides escorting the aircraft carriers, of course, when an invasion would take place on the islands, they would use the big 16-inch guns, to soften up the beachheads, take out ammunition dumps, and other targets that might be um, within range of their big guns. The extreme range of a 16-inch gun is 24 miles. Generally, they wouldn't go outside more than 20 miles. And I'll talk about the projectiles, the 16-inch projectiles, a little further out. Uh, unfortunately, um, Iowa and other ships managed to get into a typhoon. It's called uh, Halsey's Typhoon. A typhoon is the nickname, or the Cobra Typhoon. It damaged one of her propeller shafts, and she had to come all the way back to uh, San Francisco to Hunters Point Navy Yard for refurbishment. Here's a picture of her in dry docks, and this is uh, January of 1945. Here's a rare color picture of uh, Iowa steaming in the Pacific. The Iowas carried an enormous amount of fuel oil, approximately 2,400,000 gallons. And so what they would do is refuel other escorting smaller ships, frigates, destroyers, and cruisers, because they had smaller uh, oil storage tanks. So the joke was they called them the armored oilers. <laughs> but it 
meant that you didn't endanger one of your tankers in a combat zone if you could refuel your escorting warships. So that was a good plus. Here's a crew, another color picture, which is rare for that time, of the 20 millimeters up in the bow section. And I did want to talk about also uh, the float planes were in, on board Iowa and many other cruisers and battleships in that era had float planes and they would take off on catapults and they could do air reconnaissance. They could also uh, look for the spotting the fall of the shells to make adjustments to the gunnery crew. They also rescued a lot of um, aviators that crashed in the water and then they could be a radio relay signal uh, from the ship to send your signal further out. At nighttime, they would fly anti-submarine patrols, and you could pop a flare. If you saw somebody, throw it in that area, and the destroyers would pounce on them, hopefully with their depth charges. These were very common. Uh, the Kingfishers were an older plane. Later on, there was a Curtis Seahawk. Then in the uh, Korean War, her second commissioning, they had the early helicopters coming on board. Finally, in the 80s, it was total helicopters that were used uh, on board the ship. But the float planes, uh, it was interesting. They were very exposed out in the stern. And the captains kind of had a love-hate relationship with them. If they were in bad weather, they would get blown over a lot. They were fragile back there. Um, if they knew they were going into combat, they would try to fly them off and land them in a safe area, maybe an island close by. At nighttime, if they did get hit, and if you were in combat and the aviation gas caught fire, that would give away your, your you know, targeting uh, to uh, your enemy, so you didn't want that to take place either. So it was kind of a mixed blessing uh, for a long time. Of course, the aircraft carriers took this uh, mission over uh, later on, reconnaissance uh, and, and those uh, spotting the shells, things of that nature. Here's a great picture. Uh, Iowa's on your right-hand side. This is taken from the bow, looking aft. And on the left was uh, Missouri, her sister ship, and they're doing a transfer at sea. Uh, could be mail or maybe a personnel supplies. Normally it was films. That was the main entertainment in those days was films. And if you had the latest motion picture film, you were in great demand. Another uh, unknown item is um, on a, three occasions, the American Navy spun off our fast battleships and they went in close to the coastline of Japan and they shelled port facilities and wartime factories. And were very effective in this job. And a lot of the factory workers were uh, very dismayed because normally you can hear an airplane strike coming with the airplane's you know, noise or hum. But with the battleships, they were just off the coast. And the first thing they heard were the shells hitting them. So a lot of the factory workers were so uh, psychologically uh, disturbed that they didn't come back to work for like a week. Now, Iowa was actually a part of the um, fleet that steamed into Tokyo Bay for the surrender of the Japanese. And Missouri's known for that actual surrender ceremony taking place on her 01 level. Here's a picture of Missouri with escorting destroyers uh, leading Iowa. And they first went into uh, Sagami Bay, which is actually just next to Tokyo Harbor, to accept the surrender of the local naval base and learn the presence of the minefields. So when the fleet came in the next day to accept uh, formal ceremonies or perform the formal surrender ceremony, uh, they wouldn't be hitting any mines, of course. Iowa was actually right next to the Missouri. She was the lead communication ship for the formal surrender ceremony. And this is a souvenir booklet uh, that we copied from one of the sailors, September 2nd, uh, 1945. So during the three years of war, of World War II, Iowa steamed over 190,000 miles, and she earned nine battle stars. And a battle star is when you're in some campaign or a battle that the Navy recognizes and they award that to all the people that participated. So not only can the ship put that up on her bridge where her ribbons or awards are, but the sailors can also wear that on their uh, chest of ribbons. After World War II, uh, Iowa was actually in and out of Long Beach, the naval base. She conducted a lot of training exercises. This is a picture in 1947. She would participate in Navy days in either um, San Francisco or up in the Washington, Oregon area. So she was very active um, still at that point in time. A great story to tell, the Iowa had a dog. It was actually Captain McCrea's dog. And they made him mascot first class. He was there from the very beginning of the ship being commissioning, so therefore he was a plank owner. 
When Roosevelt came into the captain's cabin, he actually requested that the dog stay with him because he didn't want to disturb his schedule. So he got to bunkmate with President Roosevelt. He was the most traveled dog in probably World War II, we think, because he was on Iowa all throughout World War II. And we think he was the first American canine in occupied Japan. <laughs> he actually had a service record, uh, a health uh, record. He was busted in rank a couple of times for going AWOL and for fighting. <laughs> And here's an actual report on the right-hand side, and it says AWOL for a period of about 24 hours, conduct un unbecoming to a first-class petty officer, creating a disturbance, and then in parentheses it says fighting. So you can see him, he's getting piped off board here. He has his own sea bag, and uh, his own side boys are uh, sending him off. Here is a formal portrait of Vicky. His real name was Victory. Anyhow, very fun story. Shortly after uh, World War II, uh, Iowa was decommissioned. Um, I tried to locate some pictures of that. So far, I haven't been able to find any. But just within a few couple short years, she was recalled for the Korean War. And this shows her uh, coming out of what's called mothballs. It's when you put a ship in the reserve fleet and button her all up. They run dehumidifiers. They nicknamed that going in, you know, that period of time going into mothballs. It's really formally the reserve fleet. So July 14th, 1951, she's being pulled out for reactivation to go out to the uh, Korean War. All three of her sister ships uh, were brought out as well, and I believe Missouri was already uh, still in service at that point in time. So another dry dock shot in uh, San Francisco as she uh, prepares to go out to the Korean War. Here's recommissioning of August 1951. I would imagine after World War II when they decommissioned the ship, they left her in a fantastic condition. So it didn't take very long at all to get the ship back out to the Korean War. During the uh, second and third Korean winters, Iowa and her sister ships stood off the coast of Korea and they were shooting um, not only in support of the United Nations troops, they were also shooting uh, train stations, port facilities, ammunition dumps, and uh, about anything their guns would reach. And if you could just imagine a mobile gun platform going up and down the coast of Korea, they were very, very effective. They fired over 4,005-inch, 16-inch main battery shells, which was twice as many than they fired in World War II. She steamed over 40,000 miles, and at one point in time, she was the Seventh Fleet's uh, flagship, which was, of course, a great honor. Returning from the Korean service uh, off Pearl Harbor, this is November of 1952. At this point in time, uh, all the 20 millimeter guns that I mentioned earlier were taken off. They were obsolete at this point in time uh, against any kind of uh, more now, you know, faster aircraft. But the 40 millimeter guns were still on board as well. This is a real famous picture. It was a real unique moment off the East Coast. The four sister ships, the four Iowas, got together for a, a photograph. And I don't know the exact location of each one, but this is Iowa, Missouri, New Jersey, Wisconsin. There was actually six Iowa-class battleships that were authorized. And the ones that were not completed were the Illinois and the Kentucky. The Illinois was 22% complete, and the Kentucky was about 73% complete. They almost turned the Kentucky into a missile battery uh, she was left around um, unfinished for many, many years. Finally, the Wisconsin accidentally rammed a destroyer called the Eaton, and it crunched her bow or, or, or moved her bow sideways, which needed replaced. So they took the Kentucky's bow and they put it on the Wisconsin. And of course, then they ended up calling the Wisconsin the Wistucky. <laughs> but she also ended up being a few inches longer, so she had bragging rights. But then they ended up scrapping uh, the Kentucky then. Her engines ended up going to some supply vessels, so some of the parts ended up on board other warships. Also, uh, after the Korean War, the uh, Iowas were used for uh, midshipman cruises. They would show the flag and go around foreign ports. Here's a couple of cruise uh, books. On the right is a midshipman cruise Alpha from 1957 from the battleship Iowa. And then on the left, also in 1957, is a Mediterranean cruise. This was something normal. The capital ships, such as aircraft carriers and battleships, would always take the Annapolis uh, uh, midships and also reserve us out for training. They had a lot of space, uh, and they were very good for that effort. 
you also got to show the flag around the world. Another big moment for Iowa was uh, being part of the International Navy Review at Hampton Roads, Virginia. Uh, you can see one of the early helicopters flying overhead. That's a HUP-1. They still had the crane on the stern at this point in time. Sometimes they would actually land the helicopters on one of the turrets forward and twist the second turret sideways. I have some very interesting pictures uh, of that taking place. Then once again, Iowa for the second time entered um, the mothball fleet or the reserve fleet. Uh, this is her in um, Philadelphia. At the top center, you can see uh, two of the Iowa class battleships, probably the Wisconsin, and I believe the New Jersey's at the lower uh, part of the uh, anchorage there. So she was in the reserve fleet this point in time for 26 years. Here's a picture, uh, Wisconsin, New Jersey, and Iowa. The center ship, New Jersey, the uh, cocooned looking items are 40 millimeter guns. This is how they're preserved uh, or mothballed. When the ships are um, in decommissioned mode, they're sealed airtight, they do run dehumidifiers, and then also below, they have a negative electrolysis field. It's a electrical field to prevent rusting. Uh, they don't maintain the ships on the outside. They're more concerned about the interiors. In the 1980s, the Cold War started heating up with the Soviet Union. They did a massive expansion with their naval fleet. And I featured here probably the arch nemesis of the Iowa-class battleships, and this was the Kirov. So President Reagan and the Navy, in their attempt to build up the fleet to about a 660 uh, surface fleet, decided to bring out the four Iowas once again. And it was kind of surprising, a lot of people didn't understand it, but for the same price of reactivating an Iowa-class battleship, that equaled just building a far less capable Perry-class frigate. And even though cruise missiles were the main weapon at that point in time, the armor on the Iowa-class battleships would easily defeat the smaller cruise missiles. The Iowa-class battleships were designed to take hits from huge 16-inch shells, and they were, the cruise missiles were far less powerful than a big 16-inch shell. But a lot of people had a hard time getting uh, that understanding. So I was pulled out of mothballs for the third time. The shows are coming out and uh, getting ready to tow to the Avondale shipyard in New Orleans, and also uh, part of her uh, fitting out was at Pasigula, Mississippi at Ingalls. Two other pictures. This is in 1982. I love these pictures when the ships go into uh, dry docks or uh, shipyards to be um, brought out and modernized. You can see all kinds of scaffolding. There's power lines coming over, air vents, just a numerous uh, amount of equipment that is on board the ship as she's uh, not only reactivated, but modernized. And this is in 1983. Looking at the uh, aft end of, of uh, Iowa, now the crane is off that used to be there for the aircraft. You see turret three, the aft stern will become a big helicopter area. And you can see the amount of work that's taking place to get the ship ready for her third commissioning. Down below in the dry docks, the twin rudders are 21 feet tall. The two propellers are 40,000 pounds or 20 tons each. And they're made out of manganese bronze. The five bladed interior uh, Propellers are 17 feet across the diameter. The four bladed ones are 18 uh, feet across. And there's two port and starboard. This is a, a quad uh, ship. There's four boiler rooms on board Iowa that lead into the four separated uh, engine rooms. And she is just steam powered. It's oil fired steam. They used bunker sea oil in World War II in Korea. And then in the 80s, they converted over to what was being used in those days, diesel fuel or marine uh, diesel fuel. Good Morning America featured the Iowa crew as they were preparing to have a gigantic commissioning ceremony. Vice President Bush was one of the uh, speakers at the third commissioning. So here's a picture uh, of the crew at attention and they were rehearsing for the, the big day of bringing uh, Iowa back into the fleet. Here's the crew about ready to run on board when they uh, as part of the ceremony when they tell them to. This is at Pasigula, Mississippi in uh, 1984. And the ship is uh, what's called dressed overall uh, with signal flags. There's a Marine detachment on board uh, battleships. That was always a tradition. At this point in time, uh, there were 65 Marines. 
about 55 to 60 uh, naval officers and about 1,500 crew. In World War II, with the enormous amount of anti-aircraft batteries on board the ship, the crew size swelled up to 2,800. There was 110 uh, Marines on board and their detachment at that point in time, and about 150 officers. So this is a great picture as the ship came out as a modernized battleship in the 80s. And in the center of the picture, um, you can see some long tubes. This is where the 32 Tomahawk missiles were stored and armored box launchers. There's eight armored box launchers. So now she had a strategic long reach. Some of the Tomahawk missiles uh, for land targets, for, against land targets, could range as long as 1,400 miles. There was also an anti-ship version that was 250 miles uh, long. And she also could carry a nuclear-tipped uh, strategic Tomahawk missile. She also carried 16 Harpoon missiles. This is an anti-ship missile with a medium range of about 75 miles. And then for uh, defense against the cruise missiles, you see the white domes uh, in the center of the superstructure. These are called phalanx guns. There's four of them. It's a Gatling gun that fires a 20 millimeter, uh, highly dense titanium uh, bullet. And it could go 3,000 rounds per minute out to 2,000 yards. There was also many new electronic warfare uh, systems added. Of course, new communication gear, and then um, also radars and sonars to come up to speed with the rest of the ships. So you had a, an incredible blend of good old fashioned hard hitting 16 inch guns covered it with great armor that hasn't been made since World War II, great speed even by today's standards, 33 knots, and then all the modern uh, weaponry and sensors that came into play. And she truly entered the 80s as being one of the most uh, powerful warships in the world, all four of the Iowas. One area the ships were weak in was anti-air uh, attack or support. So you'd never see an Iowa-class battleship without some sort of escort that had um, anti-air missiles. Her most frequent partner was the Ticonderoga. Uh, she's an Aegis-class cruiser. They called her the Tyco. And here, uh, Tyco is being refueled once again by Iowa because, of course, Iowa has these enormous um, fuel reserves. The other thing that uh, is normally not mentioned, and I do like to call out, um, especially in the World War II era, besides the fuel that the ship brought to other ships, she had enormous food stores. A lot of times, uh, some of these ships had been out at sea in wartime and were not getting um, replenished with food. So Iowa would send over a lot of food they had. She had about 90 to 120 days sometimes of food and sometimes their crew would even go hungry, but they were trying to keep everybody fed within their task force group. There was also machine shops on board that even at one point in time, Iowa had a forge so they could repair almost anything that was damaged with your other ships in the task force group. And she had uh, larger medical facilities and dental facilities. If somebody needed surgery, they could bring them over to the ship. So she was almost like a tender besides being an incredible warship. Iowa shot more, of course, 16-inch guns, not in anger uh, at this point in time during the Cold War, but just for training exercises. And she holds the record for the longest range shot. At one point, uh, they measured a gunshot of 26.9 miles. In the Cold War era, she fired her guns 2,873 times. And since 1943, during all three of her commissionings, she fired her big 16-inch guns 11,834 times. Here's an aerial view of uh, the 16-inch guns going off. There's a slight delay with the three guns when you do uh, a broadside or a salvo, and it goes left, right, and center is the firing order. So you don't want to push the guns aiming, and you can see a slight delay. Another myth, um, the guns, or the ship itself, when the big guns fire, the ship doesn't move sideways. The guns themselves do recoil 47 inches. They uh, do have a huge uh, width. It's a 108 foot beam on the ship and the deep draft. And the captain during, um, off the New Jersey during the Vietnam War actually made some calculations to prove that the ship wouldn't move at all. The picture on the left shows a crew member tying down the projectiles. There's two main projectiles carried by the Iowa-class battleships. The blue one, this would have been the uh, armor-piercing shell, AP. It's 2,700 pounds. 
and it's 74 inches tall. It could go through 30 feet of reinforced concrete or about 18 inches of armor, depending on the penetration angle. The second common shell was called a high capacity shell, HC. It was for soft targets like beachheads. It was smaller, it was 1,900 pounds and 64 inches tall, but it could leave a crater 20 feet deep, 50 feet wide, and it had a bursting diameter of 200 yards. The Marines loved it. In fact, a new New Jersey came out during the Vietnam War. She was the only one of the Iowas that did. They used to fire one of the high capacity shells into the jungle. They'd blow out a landing zone. The helicopters would land and the troops would disperse out into the jungle to attack the enemy. Uh, Iowa and the sistership Wisconsin today, we are still in a special category of reserves. Technically, we could still be recalled into active service because they don't want to give up these big guns. Now, it's probably not likely that would take place. The oil uh, it takes to fire the ship is really you know, expensive today, and she does gobble a lot of fuel, basically about 200 gallons per mile. <laughs> and also, the other um, expense that the Navy is dealing with today is the size of the crews on their warships. And they're trying to automate the ships as much as possible to bring down the numbers then you have less of uh, salaries and benefits that are associated with operating that vessel. Um, remember, Iowa was designed in 1938, so she's not automated <laughs> at all, and she does take a large crew, as I mentioned, 1,500 during the 80s to uh, maintain the ship. Just to operate in the engine room is about 450 people. You could spend a whole hour talking about the armor that is on board the Iowa-class battleships. But there was two types that are the heavy areas. These are called Class A and Class B armor. They haven't been made since World War II. In fact, they had to reopen the factories because, as I mentioned, we hadn't built any capital warships for over 16 years. So just to get the type of armor that was needed, they had to reopen these factories. But if you can see in the center low section of the ship, there's a, a dark darker blue area. This is called the Armored Citadel. And on top was six inches of armor uh, to protect any shells that were coming down. And on the sides were two belts of armor. And the tops were 12.5 or 12.1 inches of armor. They were keyed into a lower section that started out at 12.1 inches and tapers down to an inch. Um, these were at a 19 degree angle, which gave you the equivalence of 13.5 inches of armor. Now the upper decks are lightly armored. Uh, some areas are protected with giant armored tubes, like your critical communication and fire control wiring. The turrets themselves, you see the two forward and the one aft, they have enormous armored forged plates around them. And then they are resting on barbettes. Uh, that are also uh, protecting all the guns, the gun crews, and the machinery to operate them. So very, harm, very, very armored ship. Over 42% uh, of Iowa's weight is devoted to this armor. During the 80s, during the Cold War um, period, President and Mrs. Reagan were on board Iowa for the Liberty Weekend, which was uh, the Statue of Liberty's 100th anniversary celebration, and Iowa was used as the review ship. And here they are uh, underneath Turret 1. This is July 4th, 1986. Here's Iowa steaming down the Hudson River as part of the uh, 100th anniversary review. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Iowa and other capital ships like aircraft carriers, they normally don't go out into a combat area without escorts. So here's a picture. This is uh, Iowa at the front, and it's leading the aircraft carrier Midway directly behind her. This is 1987. You can see the escorting uh, destroyers, frigates, and also uh, cruisers and a few supply uh, ships in the background. The one item you normally don't hear mentioned, it's not really top secret, um, but it's just not called out very often. In these task force groups, even up to today, you normally have a 100 killer submarine down below or very close. One or two is normally in the area. And I always think of them kind of as a bloodhound out there sniffing around to see what's going on that might be getting close to their uh, ships that they're protecting. 
This is a great picture. It shows both the 16-inch guns and the 5-inch guns with a full salvo uh, during one of the training exercises. And Iowa began um, using some of the more modern uh, equipment. This is a remotely piloted vehicle called the Pioneer. It's still in service now with the Marines. Uh, it would be launched off the stern of the ship. It had a close observation camera and also um, a uh, imaging uh, camera, thermal imaging camera. And you could use that instead of the old float planes. It was caught in a net on the back of the stern, and you can just see that barely. Uh, the crew had a difficult time flying it. Uh, they used to have some crack ups every once in a while. I've got a uh, souvenir propeller from one of those uh, back at uh, the ship. Here's a, a crew member's picture as they are in the North Atlantic. This is called Operation Ocean Safari, an exercise with uh, NATO. And this was the ship's crest over to the right for her third commissioning. The two stars on the bottom represent her service in World War II in Korea. And then the third star was for her uh, third commissioning. And it shows the American Eagle bringing her pennant number, 61, uh, back to life and back to the ship. The uh, Iowa's motto is the same as the state of Iowa's. Our liberties we prize, our rights we will maintain. Unfortunately, on April 19th of 1989, there's what's called an open breach explosion took place in turret two in the center gun. There was a fire that broke out. There's two secondary explosions. Both the left and the right guns actually still were loaded. The crew responded marvelously. They put out the fire, which lasted over 90 minutes, and they did have to flood some of the powder magazines to prevent losing the ship entirely. Uh, during this whole episode, it did kill 47 sailors. We, have, um, we did the first uh, ceremony when we came on the ship, our nonprofit group, in 2011. And, uh, oh, actually 2012, excuse me, and then we just did our second ceremony uh, to recognize the sailors. One of our um, current staff members was on board the ship that day. He's an Iowa veteran. And turret two is sealed today. Uh, it'll never be open to the public. And we have a memorial plaque uh, on the starboard side to uh, remember that day. Iowa did go on, however, to do one more gigantic uh, deployment. In Northern Europe, she went to many, many ports. This is Portsmouth, England. And of course, you know how much they love their naval history. There was a gigantic turnout everywhere she went in Europe. At this point, um, she traveled for this deployment over 30,900, that's nautical miles, across the time zones, eight time zones uh, during that period. But then um, with the high expense of operating these ships, it was decided to retire the uh, four Iowa ships. The uh, Wisconsin and Missouri did participate in a desert storm and they fired into Kuwait as a diversion with the Marines so the army could run in around uh, into Iraq. Uh, she fired her Tomahawk missiles and her 16 inch guns. So at a very cold day in Norfolk, Virginia, the uh, third decommissioning took place. Uh, the weather was so poor, they actually went inside to conduct the ceremonies and they're signing the uh, final uh, day's orders here. So Iowa, uh, as I already mentioned, picked up uh, nine battle stars in World War II. If you see the second row in the center, uh, the center ribbon is the Asiatic Pacific Campaign ribbon from World War II. The center star, the silver star, that equals five stars. And then you have the two gold stars on, uh, or, or bronze stars on both sides. So there's your nine battle stars. Um, the third row on the far right, the blue, white, blue ribbon, that was the Korean War ribbon, and she had two battle stars uh, from there. There's several other ribbons, uh, United Nations, Philippi Philippine occupation uh, from World War II, um, but I won't uh, list them all. So in total, close to 20 years of service in the actual um, reserve, or active service, and then 50 years in the reserve service. Um, Iowa was retired once again, and initially she was in Philadelphia and then moved to Newport, Rhode Island. That was 11 years on the Atlantic Fleet uh, Reserve. Then she was uh, switched with the New Jersey. The New Jersey was on the uh, West Coast, and she needed to come back to the East Coast to be retired as a museum memorial ship. So they did a swap because Iowa didn't have a definite home, 
and they still were being pulled in and out of the reserve fleet. So this is Iowa on her way back to the west coast. Remember she has a, a, a beam of 108 feet. The Panama Canal is 110 feet wide. So there's a foot clearance port and starboard as she goes through. So that's an incredible experience to uh, watch her going through. Iowa has arrived at the west coast. This is in uh, 2001 again. And she's going up to Susun Bay Reserve Fleet in Benicia, California. Took me forever to be able to pronounce those words. <laughs> This is how, um, about two years ago, when our nonprofit group, group Pacific Battleship Center, Center, started visiting the Iowa, this is how we would uh, arrive to see the ship. You can see Iowa at the far left, her great length, anchored with the rest of the reserve fleet at Susun. We used to arrive at six o'clock in the morning. We would take a boat and then go up a ladder to board Iowa. There was only one door you could enter, everything else was sealed, but we would spend the day on board the ship learning about her systems, trying to figure out future tour routes, what work would be needed before the ship uh, would come down to uh, the, her permanent home, the Port of Los Angeles. This is Iowa uh, picture once again, after 21 years in the reserve fleet. If you notice um, her superstructure in the center, the top of the mast has been cut off to go underneath the bridges to get to this anchorage. And it was welded back on the stern. So that was something we had to reattach later on. Here's a picture you can see um, after 21 years, the neglect that has taken place on the exterior. However, the interior with the dehumidifiers was in great shape. The teakwood decks that were normally uh, used on the ship, some of the areas were replaced by Douglas fir in the 80s. And this wood just simply rotted away. We've had to pull that up. Uh, when we can afford to, we do want to reteak uh, the ship. There's 54,000 square feet, approximately, of teakwood deck area. So you can imagine how much that's going to cost to go do. Here's some more pictures from our staff photographer. Everything is sealed. Um, we actually lived on board the ship, about 10 of us, for nine months. There was uh, no electricity. There was no water. Uh, we had to bring our food on board. Um, during December and January, it was quite cold. <laughs> we nicknamed the ship um, the Armored Icebox. <laughs> I remember one night I had four blankets over me and I was wearing thermals and I was still cold. This is the big day where we uh, began towing out of the reserve fleet with uh, tugboats. You can see the other uh, mothballed ships in the background. And we're just squeezing literally underneath the Benicia Martinez Bridge. The people on our upper level were having conversations right about at this height with the Caltran workers above us. So that was an interesting experience. This is going down the Carquina Straits towards the Port of Richmond. We anchored at the Port of Richmond for the following nine months. That's actually where the refurbishment, repainting uh, work took place. This is our first day at the Port of Richmond at Terminal 3. We wanted to have Iowa looking her best because we're you know, close to Hollywood here. <laughs> so before we got Iowa down to this area, we definitely wanted to repaint her. Here's a great picture I love. The painting effort finally started. The main reason we were able to rescue the ship and have her refurbished to bring her down to the Port of Los Angeles was from a $3 million grant from the state of Iowa. They've been extremely supportive. Um, they love their ship. There's a gigantic model in the state capitol. The fifth graders each year, as part of their uh, curriculum, uh, go there to learn about the Iowa. Her silver service from the officer's wardroom is still there uh, as well. So she's uh, well thought of. Here's our core group. Um, if you notice, somebody might look familiar there. I'm standing on the far right with some uh, coveralls. That was our normal uniform. But there was just a small group, and most all of us were civilians too. We had this gigantic passion to save the last American battleship, and we wanted to bring it down here to the Port of Los Angeles. We thought it was appropriate to bring it back here. The Pacific Fleet was here at one point in time with many other uh, battleships that unfortunately wound up at Pearl Harbor. Um, but this was the last battleship. We knew she had to be uh, saved, and Iowa had such a beautiful history and they are gorgeous warships. If you can call a warship attractive, I think these are. 
this was the big day where we finally put the uh, mast. We had to have a big, huge crane with 184 lift capability. We actually had uh, dignitaries and politicians, VIPs fly out from Iowa uh, for this event, and they put uh, coins or quarters from Iowa uh, to step the mast, which is an old naval tradition. Uh, so it was a great uh, photo opportunity day for the media as well. We wouldn't have been able to get out and tow out of the Port of Richmond if it wasn't for the most incredible selfless volunteers that came and worked with us uh, from the Port of Richmond. And this is a group photograph. On the weekends, we opened up the bow, just the bow alone for $10 and allowed public on board the ship. We had a museum off in an adjoining warehouse and we were just open uh, Saturday and Sunday. Then during the weekdays, our volunteers would show up and do all kinds of incredible work around the ship. Uh, getting her ready for uh, visitors um, at the Port of Los Angeles. Now this is a ship uh, we finished after a nine month refurbishment effort. We're ready to tow her down to the Port of Los Angeles. Just as we were ready, some bad weather hit off the coast and we had to stop and wait almost a full week. <laughs> but the ship finally did leave. Um, this was her being pulled out of the San Francisco Bay. There was a great turnout. It was the same weekend, which was the 75th anniversary of the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. So Iowa is passing underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, and we really reflected on this moment because we thought it would be the last time an American battleship will ever you know, pass underneath their span. And there's so many uh, famous photographs of ships returning from war, uh, battleships, cruisers, aircraft carriers, and passing underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. Iowa arrives. Uh, in San Pedro to her temporary mooring. So we opened uh, last July 7th uh, to a great crowd. We just completed our first year anniversary. We've had 330,000 people come in attendance, which we're really happy about. We're starting to do more special events um, out on the stern uh, with food and entertainment. And that's the final slide. Shows us at birth 87. That's going to be our permanent home. We hope to interact more and more with uh, our local populace. We do think we're gonna be um, an iconic part of the waterfront and this new waterfront effort that's taking place now to upgrade uh, ports of call and upgrade the traffic and things like that. We believe we're the cornerstone uh, for that and we're real excited uh, for the future, not only for this area, uh, but of course for our, our battleship as well. Thank you for watching Peninsula Senior Lecture Series. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.